Hello, welcome and a very good evening. And today we have a new guest here. It's an Amiga, a Commodore Amiga 500 that is. It's a German edition with a, a Kratz keyboard and the umlauts and everything. So this is what friends of mine would have had back in high school in the early 90s or maybe even the late 80s when I was still in primary school. So um, yeah, we earlier this month we had the Commodore 1084S monitor and it would of course go along with this machine for example. And this machine here is working fine. There's not much to do about it. It has a 512K RAM expansion, a modern one, not an old one with a leaky RTC. Uh, I have so far not opened this up yet, so we will definitely have a look inside today. And what I want to attach to it is one of my Gotek floppy drives. I already put it in an external enclosure because I actually do like to have the original floppy drive in here because that's actually very charming that we still have the floppy drive. But using the floppy drives, for example, the original Cluento Workbench 1.3 for boot up or the uh, Amiga version of Monkey Island 2, that's pretty nice. But especially the Amiga um, discs, the game discs, for example, for Monkey Island 2, are getting older by the day. I mean, I can buy new um, workbench discs, that's no problem, but getting the original floppy disks for Monkey Island 2 will be quite a difficult thing. So sometimes I would like to use the original floppy disk, but for expensive stuff or things that have a lot of disks like Monkey Island, where you need to do a lot of disk swapping, the Gotek is definitely a better solution. And the Gotek is just the regular one that I already modeled in an earlier version for the PC. It has the OLED display and yeah, that's basically it. It has the OLED display and it has a standard PC interface. So what I bought here is an adapter cable, which uh, you can get from the Amiga store and some other places. Um, I will put a link in the description. And it has just two simple ICs there, a flip-flop and an AND gate. I don't know for sure what it actually does, but um, it translates between the Amiga, I think it's, this is probably a DB23 port as well, uh, to the uh, port on the floppy side, basically. It makes it compatible. Uh, you don't have to do much or anything apart from that. The device has to be jumper to be uh, device zero, and then everything should work. Note the direction of the cable that it has go get to the drive. I will show you a close-up picture um, because on my device the uh, red bar isn't on pin one, but it's actually on pin thirty-four. So the whole ribbon cable is twisted. It doesn't hurt anything, but you have to put on. The ribbon cable in the wrong fashion. Anyway, when we install this we will also uh, be able to use a second drive on the Amiga, but the problem with the Amiga is that a lot of the games are basically booter games. You don't uh, run the workbench per se, but you have to put in the disk in the first disk drive and then boot the game by powering on the Amiga. The external GoTek drive will be not drive zero, the first drive, but drive one, the second drive. And many games won't run from that. So we will need an additional piece of hardware. And that piece of hardware is this. This is the so-called DF0 selector or boot selector. And uh, there's a jumper here, which you can remove and replace with a nice little flip switch. And um, this goes in the place where I think one of the CIAs is. I think there are two CIAs in the Amiga, which is, whoops, which is basically a uh, interface chip. And we just put the chip up here and the whole thing goes into the socket. And then we can plug in the switch here and toggle before booting the Amiga 
if the external drive is floppy drive 0 or 1, which makes it possible to use the external GoTech to boot images off of it, which is a very nice thing indeed. So for that you need to open the Amiga, you have to remove um, one of the CIA chips, there's a very nice instruction leaflet for this made by the Amiga store. And uh, this is actually the CIA chip here that we need to remove. So the difficult part will be actually to unscrew all the screws and take apart the Amiga. Well, I've never done that. But that's about to change. So let's give it a try. Okay, so it opened up actually quite nicely. Um, you have to bend these latches here for the RF shield, but I didn't have to unplug the keyboard or anything else. And I must say, this whole thing here looks amazingly in good condition. The caps are not even slightly bulged. And uh, this down here are the main 512k of RAM. This here is actually the modern RAM expansion. I uh, think we can put a second uh, chip here, which might be an interesting mod to do. Uh, probably needs to have this jumper set. And, oh, okay, no, this only works with the A500 and plus, it seems. Okay, so that would be for the plus, but we have the base model which is nice. And actually everything is quite nicely labeled here. This is the Denise chip, this is the Paula chip, um, the Paula doing the sound mainly, the odd CIA and the even CIA. And this even CIA is actually what we need to replace. If we have a, if we have a look at this, it says here the even CIA is needed to be replaced. To get this actually out of here, I might want to unplug the power connection of the floppy drive. And then I need to do some leveraging. Here's the CPU. It's a 68000 made by SD, so SGS Thompson, I think that is. And there's some custom chip by Commodore that is the ROM. And the Fat Agnes is, I think, I have no idea actually. I think it's for graphics and other stuff. But I'm not quite sure. Well, um, the Amiga buffs out there will probably know what it is for. Yeah, but it's a pretty clean and pretty nice uh, thing. It says here 8500, 8500. Um, any date codes on here? I'm not sure this one has a 1988 date code. Actually, all of those have 1988 date codes. So this is either from 1988 or 1989, which makes it already more than 30 years old. That's pretty nice. Um, all of the connectors were made by Foxconn, which is still a thing today, and probably not for connectors, but for assembling iPhones, for example. So um, how do we get the CIA out? I would say, there are two capacitors who are, which are slightly in the way, but I will fetch some tools and then we can try to get it out. There are specialized tools for that, um, for unplugging chips. But I usually use one of those things that come with the cheap soldering irons. Mainly I will use uh, this piece here, uh, which has a flat tip at the end, which is a bit angled and you can use it to slowly lever the chip out of its socket. There are also things that grab below the uh, chip, but I haven't had good success with it because then you're most of the time you bend the pins as well. And there are specialized extractors, chip extractors, uh, but I don't have one of them. You can use those as well. And they are supposed to work well, 
but I can't tell you because I don't have one. So now we're gonna unplug the floppy cable and the power cable so that we can access the CIA better. So there, that's a MOS 8520A successfully extracted from week 29, 1988. So that's uh, well over 30 years old. And you can still get replacements for this, I think. There's also some, some emulation replacement being made. But I'm not sure of that. Um, but yeah, take care of these things because they are not made anymore by anyone. Yeah, so that's good. Now we'll insert it into the switcher and then we will have a look at where to place the actual switch. So let's take the DFO switcher board and to the right you can see a notch. So take your CIA chip and carefully align its notch to the notch on the socket. And then press firmly on both ends of the chip to make it snap in. You need to use quite a bit of force, so make sure that you don't bend any pins and that all the pins go into the holes. And then you have this great, great sandwich here and we will just put it into the right empty CIA socket on the Amiga board. Make sure to align the notches of the whole stack with the notch of the socket on the A500 motherboard. If you don't do that, you might destroy or damage the chip, because it has a specific orientation, of course, like basically all chips have. So press firmly, make sure not to break the motherboard. So after some deliberation, I think I'm gonna put the switch right here because this is at the back of the machine and it won't disturb the optics, what do you call it? It won't disturb how the machine looks basically. And I bent down the RF shield here at this place a little bit. So if you want, you can just bend it back and actually replacement cases are available if you want, but this 1988 one is just fine, I would say. And I can put the switch right at the back of the, uh, the cable, right at the back of the floppy drive around here and then through there. So all I need to do now is drill a hole using my Makita uh, battery powered drill and a metal drill bit because that's what I usually use for drilling plastic. There will be a screw here, so I won't put it right there, but rather a little bit over to the left, so we are not disturbing the mounting of the screw. And then I'm just gonna drill away. Be careful with your fingers. So that was a bit quick at the end. Uh, always be careful. Always be careful when drilling. And uh, yeah, we produced some, I would say, Parmigiano or Reggiano here, but that's just plastic filings. Um, the hole is not perfect uh, because there's still a bit of those plastic chips attached there. Yeah, this filed away most of the stuff, that's good. So that's fine. Wipe away all the remaining fluff inside. Now we can check if the switch will fit through there. There's enough leeway at the backs that I should be able to maneuver this in here without removing the floppy drive. Yes, fits just nicely. It's now currently in the off position, so this should be um, external SDF0 and this should be external SDF1. So let's try to fasten this with the supplied washers. And I think, I made a mistake, I think this one belongs on the inside so that the switch can't twist around. Uh, 
And then I'll remove the flat cable once more. Put this nicely away. And now this looks pretty clean, I would say. So you can reach it easily with your right hand. So that should be fine. Now we just close up the whole device and we're gonna test it. Fingers crossed everything will work. I am setting the switch to the position where it boots from the GoTech. Power on the monitor and the Amiga and first you get the splash screen but uh, it show, doesn't show the kickstart hand but directly boots into the workbench because that's the disk that I selected on the GoTech. It doesn't load any faster. I skipped a bit forward here to spare you the time of loading. The GoTech is simply really only a floppy emulator and there we go. We have a functioning workbench 1.3. So what we can do now is load one of the more difficult things, like one of the demos, because those wouldn't run from the workbench, so I can't start them from the external floppy if it's DF1. But here you can see it boots just fine if the GoTech is DF0. And yeah, they usually have some kind of fast loading mechanism and they pull all sorts of tricks and really demand high degree of compatibility from all the peripherals and the Amiga. So I'm very pleased to say that this is definitely a great success. The mod works fine. One thing that I noticed is that the whole stack is a bit high and it pushes against the RF shield, so you might want to cut a hole into the RF shield or remove it altogether if you're that kind of guy. But um, for now I would say I will leave the thing as it is, because I don't want to mod my A500 too excessively. So what is my conclusion? Is this whole mod worth the hassle? I would say definitely so, because it's actually pretty easy to do. You don't need soldering skills and the gains are quite massive actually, because all your valuable disks can be kept in the storage where they belong and you can use a cheap USB stick to play all the games, run all the software and uh, especially the demos for example, you don't have to copy them to a disk, you just dump the disk images onto the USB drive and be done with it. And that for me is definitely a big selling point. Sometimes I still want to use the floppy disks just like I want to use a vinyl record, because it's nice to handle the media. But uh, other than that, I would say for day-to-day -day playing and things like that, just use the USB drive, as I'm doing right now with Golden X. And uh, yeah, that's way more convenient than handling the floppy drive. So I think that's it for today. And I thank you very much for watching. Uh, please subscribe if you didn't already, please leave a like or a dislike. Some constructive criticism is always welcome or a discussion in the comments. And you can also support me on Patreon or Ko-Fi if you want to. If you can't or don't want to, that's fine. I just hope that we see you again in the next video. And until then, I wish you a very good time.